the right field line. Pretty well hit. Lafarn way. It's the right way here tonight. Yogi Berra said it's 90% mental. The other half is physical. My name is Ryan Lavarnway, major league catcher and minor league grinder. And I've spent the last 15 years playing professional baseball while evolving my mindset. I'm fascinated by optimizing that 90%. In this show, I'll talk to elite athletes and mindset coaches about what makes them tick and how they've overcome obstacles in their own careers on the way to finding success. This is Finding the Way. Hey guys, this is Ryan LaVarnway. Welcome to Finding the Way. Today I have a super special guest, Ryan Leaf. You all know him. Hopefully you love him. He was the number two overall pick in the NFL draft, second only to Peyton Manning, who's a Hall of Famer. He was a finalist for the Heisman Trophy. He was a first-team All-American. He played in the Rose Bowl. He did everything in the football world that you could ever hope to do. And then he had a, a turn of events, and he had some trouble with, with some drugs and, and, the, and the legal system. And now he's entering Act 3 of his life, where it's a total, total comeback and redemption story. He's an easy guy to root for. You know him, you love him. Ryan Leaf, thank you for joining me. Ryan, Ryan L. I love it. A couple of Ryan <laughs> L's hanging out, talking about life. I like it. So, so my my goal for this was to to take it one act at a time. Let's let's start with your success and what made you so good. You came from Montana, where I've heard you say multiple times now. There's more NFL quarterbacks in the Manning family than there are from the state of Montana. How did you stand out? How did you get out of there and become really the first to do what you've done out of a place where you don't see a lot of quarterbacks come from? Well, yeah, the, the line is uh, I'm the only Montanan who's been never drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. So there are more first round draft picks in the Manning family than the, than the whole state of Montana ever. So there was no roadmap. There were just, there wasn't, I, I didn't have a, a guidance system at all. So I grew up just admiring and loving sports and the sports stars. My dad got me, um, you know, excited about sports. He followed sports, so therefore I wanted to, you know, do the same thing my dad did. And so Terry Bradshaw was my hero growing up, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, they were running the 70s when I was just a little kid. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, when I started getting recognized for how talented I was, and that was head and shoulders more than anybody in my home state, my hometown, um, my heroes were different than the ones that were local, right? Uh, my heroes were the the Fab Five, right? It was Jalen Rose, um, you know, a six foot, eight inch point guard. I was terribly tall um, for where I grew up, almost six, seven, um, you know, could handle the ball. I wanted to be a point guard. Magic Johnson was my favorite basketball player of all time. Um, so, like those were my heroes and that didn't necessarily jive or fit with kind of the conservative white privileged community that I, that I grew up in. And so I wasn't very well liked. I, I was told I had a bad attitude. I was um, essentially shamed by my hometown and um, in my home state. And in, you, when you're you young and me, impressionable, can you, can you dig into that? What, what made them think that you had a bad attitude? What was it that you did or said or didn't do that that gave them that impression shaved my head wore baggy shorts uh dunked the basketball and turned into a jumbo jet as i went down the court um <laughs> they wanted they wanted this superior athlete to come from montana they just they got me instead and that's not what they liked you know uh, i tried to embarrass you when we competed that's how i won in my eyes and i figured i had to win at everything to to get out of that small town and achieve ultimately the goals I wanted to achieve. So, and I was just a kid, so I didn't know any better. Um, you know, I got resentful of people, the way they treated me. Um, you know, fans would just come on the road to boo me and on the basketball court. Um, and so I just, I began to internalize it like any great athlete does. We take things that we can use as chips on our shoulder and it motivates us. It motivates us sometimes to the highest of levels. You watch the last dance and listen to Michael Jordan, that dude who's the greatest of all time that played his sport found like the littlest slights, things here and there that would motivate. And so I think there's a bit of that in all of us who who get to that level. Um, what ultimately separates, I think everybody is how you deal with failure. Um, that's what ultimately separates the greats um, 
from the, you know, the, the guys that, that were flashing the pans type of mentality. And so for me, I would, if I was critiqued or judged, I would just, um, I would win. That's how I won. I would go win whatever that competition was. And regardless of what you had to say about me, I was like, screw you. Um, yeah. You know, I'm going to be a star. You're going to be stuck here in this little town in Montana. So, so I hear you talking about the chip on your shoulder. Uh, I've heard you talk a lot about how you had to compete at everything. And I can relate to that. My wife doesn't like playing video games or, or board games or card games with me because I, I always have to win. And she's like, well, everybody else has more fun if you let somebody else win once in a while. And I just don't have it in me. So I, I hear how you're talking about what motivated you, but what took you to the next level beyond the motivation, beyond being probably a physical beast and bigger and a man amongst boys I've seen you described as, what made you want to be the best beyond just, I want to win today and I want to win tomorrow? My work ethic. I just, I outworked everybody. You know, I, uh, I went at 6 a.m. in the morning before school started to shoot free throws and, and three pointers. And if I didn't hit the, the prerequisite amount, then I was late to class, you know, things like that. I think a lot of times when you're just super talented, people assume it just it comes easy. Like, I mean, you have to work your 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 butt off to get to the, the highest level. And so um, I think there's been a learning curve for me. Initially, it's easy because I'm so much more talented and then I have to put in the hard work to be great. Just like in college, when I ultimately got to Washington State, uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't handed the keys just because I was more talented than than anybody else. I needed to work at it, you know. I just and ultimately when I figured that out and when I started doing the work and putting in the work for for coach and my teammates, then I became the 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 star that I was. And I think it uh, at the NFL level, unfortunately you aren't able, you don't have that grace period where you can fumble around and, uh, and figure out that, Oh my God, I have to work much harder now. Yeah. Uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's really one shot and you're done at that level. And, uh, and so I never got the opportunity to really make it work because, you know, I, I had not, I had not learned my early lessons that you have to start over from the beginning. Like you may have gotten to this point, like in high school, I was, Great. When I got to college, I had to start over again. I thought I could just ease my way in and continue to do what I've always done. And there's always an evolution and a an change. And so to answer your question, where you started, it was just I outworked everybody else. I played more basketball. I played more baseball. I, I went out and threw the football around more than anybody. I mean, no one else was doing that. I didn't do anything else. I didn't drink. I didn't use drugs. I didn't go to parties. Um, you know, I, I, you know, my, you know, obsession with women, with girls at the time wasn't necessarily over the top. You know, if I had a chance to go out on a date or go, um, you know, the batting cage or, um, go to the, uh, go to the gym and hit shots or play a pickup game. I was doing, I was doing the sporting side of that thing, you know? And I think I also just assume if I'm great at it, I can have whatever girl I want anyway. So it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, before, before we get to the NFL and maybe where the success turned around on you, Let's talk about Washington State. I love the story you talk about. You were watching the Rose Bowl, and it just happened that the coach called you while you were watching the Rose Bowl. And there's there's over a million kids that play youth football and high school football in the United States. Only 6.5% of those high school players get to play in college. A third of those are D1. So the fact that you even made it to college and played, and then only 1% of those players go on to play in the NFL. So to me, the things that you've done in football are an outrageous success story no matter what. But going to Washington State, he called you. He said, I promise you, you come to Washington State. We're going to play in the Rose Bowl. You didn't do your research. You didn't know they hadn't made it to the Rose Bowl since the 30s. It had been almost 70 years. That's a similar story of me going to Yale to play baseball. They, when they recruited me, they said, what are your goals? I said, I want to play pro baseball. And he said, absolutely, I'll help you do that. What he never told me, and I didn't learn this till years later, there had never been a hitter make it to the major leagues out of Yale. I was the first one. So we have, we have a similar path there. Tell me about when you got to Washington State. You had these big goals. It hadn't been done in a long time. How did you inspire your teammates? How did you find a way to make that happen? Well, it turns out it was because of, of my coach uh, putting, putting restraints on me, essentially, not burning my red shirt, putting me on the red shirt uh, path, um, which meant I was the scout team quarterback my entire freshman year. 
And it just so happened our defense, our number one defense, was the best defense in all of college football that year. They were the number one defense in all of college football. And I went against them every single day of my freshman year. So it turns out, of course, the choice I made was because of the coach. By all, you know, by all counts, he was the reason I chose Washington State over Miami, UCLA, or Colorado, or wherever else I was looking at. And he knew best. He, he simply did. He understood. Uh, he had just sent a number one overall draft pick uh, in Drew Bledsoe to the NFL draft the year before I got there. So I knew he was, he was capable of developing a guy from a small town um, and, and to reach great heights. And so though I may have not been all on board with his thought process, because, you know, I also thought we wasted the number one overall defense in the country that year. Cause we only averaged like 10 points a game offensively. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I could do better. Uh, he understood, he understood what it was going to take. And then, you know, when I didn't do the, you know, the work in the off season to get ready for year two, I wasn't the starter going into my redshirt freshman year. And, you know, probably about mid season, he started noticing some changes in me in terms of my uh, how I would approach the film sessions, how I would approach um, practice, and then doing things on my own, which is the work ethic that I talked about earlier in high school that I, I eventually developed. And once that started become apparent and, and the offense was struggling mightily behind the quarterback at the time, um, you know, I got my shot. You know, he started me in my final game of my freshman year. Uh, against our rival and I went out and played um, I think exactly how he would ho would have hoped I was going to play and, and how I prepared and and, and I, it was my starting job from that point on and I would be the starter for my sophomore and junior years um, went through some tough times my sophomore year where we lost four consecutive to not make a bowl game which I think did a ton for us um, I've always been really which is a hard way to go, but sometimes me having to deal with a, a ton of adversity has helped me learn the lesson and overcome and get it right down the line. And sure enough, our junior year, um, it was just, it was a season of destiny. You know, some of the things that he did, he moved the schedule around where we played USC and UCLA to start the year, which, you know, normally in Washington state's history, we have not had a lot of success against those two programs. But if we were to go out and win both of them and start off two and zero in the conference, I mean, it was going to catapult us, and it did exactly that. We won both those games, and we ran off, won the championship, got a chance to play in the Rose Bowl. A ton of accolades came my way as well as his. We were really in it together. But I, I think a lot of the time, um, the team, the whole team loses um, in terms of how great everybody was. Like, we were the best team. I was a good player, but I'm not – I'm not great if I don't have the O line that I had, if I didn't have the wide receivers and the running back combination and the way the defense play. I mean, football is the consummate team game. It really is. And I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of emphasis gets placed on the coach and the quarterback. And that's just how it is. And he told me that early on like, you're going to get a lot of the praise and all the blame when things don't go right. Um, that's just the way it is. It's what we signed up for. He's exactly right. And, uh, you know, like you said, hadn't done something in 67 years that year was so magical so, so special it gave me so much um to my family um and uh and probably could have given it to my hometown and my home state if i would have allowed it to right um i told you about how they you know they always wanted a, a superior athlete that could represent them on a on a national stage and unfortunately they got me because i was so bitter and angry instead of going through that process and forgiving them in my heart and saying, you know what? No one had ever done it before. You didn't know what you were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. Let's say we both messed up and let's go do this together. Um, but instead I, I, I had all that resentment and that chip. And instead I went, I fucking told you, uh, you know, I told you I was going to do this. Fuck you all. I'm going to, I'm going to rub this in your face as I just, you know, get to experience every, uh, luxury and goal that I had ever placed in front of me and, and do it. And that's just a brain thing. That's just your mindset. When you're not able to, I guess, uh, uh, I didn't look at the way I was treated as, as, as a humbling experience, maybe understanding and being empathetic to what somebody else was doing. Instead, I was, I was resentful to a point where I was going to just bury you in the process. Well, and that's a maturity thing too. Yeah. Uh, you were, you were just I a was kid. Like you were, yeah, you're 21 years old. Now that now that you've grown up, you've 
experience some life, you can see that perspective a little bit. And I think probably let's let's fast forward a couple of years now. You're you're drafted second overall into the NFL draft by the San Diego Chargers. You you're on top of the world and you win your first two games, never been done before, just outrageous success. And then in the third week of the NFL season, you're you're sick, you're injured, you play through it, which should be commendable, but they, they give you a hard time in the media, and, and I've heard you say that you played five years in the NFL, and after that third game, the way you responded to the media ended your career ultimately, or it sent you down a spiral path that ended your career. That's part of the lack of maturity of being 21, 22 years old. Can you talk me through what happened in there and, and how, what you were feeling at the time? Well, of course, I was wrapped up in the identity of being a football player, um, a very successful football player, and that's all I was in my eyes. And, uh, you know, Peyton was considered, you know, this, this golden, this golden child kind of, and I was, um, kind of labeled as this, this kind of the, um, the, uh, the dark version of it. Right. It was like the bad Potter and, and Voldemort and, uh, both incredibly powerful and, 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 uh, successful yet, um, one was, one was vilified and the other one wasn't. And instead of actually telling people, Hey, this bothers me. I'm not that guy. I'm just this kind of, you know, kid uh, from podunk Montana who wants to play sports and be liked. And, uh, and I didn't do that. I just kind of rolled with it. I kind of rolled with the idea of Dennis Rodman. And, you know, if you didn't like me, it's been my whole life. I've always figured it out and, and ended up on top in the end, but, you know, at the highest level, it's just like you just it's so hard. It's so difficult to play that position at the highest level. And um, if you have if you don't have the resources, the life skills to deal with failure, uh, it's going to really backfire on you. And to your point, I, I played a game I probably shouldn't have. I was sick all week in the hospital with a staph infection. Game was horrible. Rainstorm, monsoon. Played bad, but it wasn't because I played bad that my career ended that day. It was because of how I dealt with it. And my whole life, I think I dealt with stuff in probably a pretty negative and toxic way, but it always worked for me. In this sense, uh, I yelled at a reporter, one of the first real viral moments in terms of video, um, where I was characterized uh, as, as this petulant, bad attitude child, kind of like I was in my childhood. And that was triggering for me. And, and so I backed myself into a wall and I just swung, kept swinging and swinging and swinging, whether that was a, a coach, a player, a media member, my family, anybody. I was, I was the big, strong football player and I had done this my whole life and therefore I'll, I'll figure it out. And so, yeah, I would, I bounce around. I played for three teams, four teams ultimately. And, uh, nothing, nothing good happened from that point on in my career and um what it turns out it was you know what was the most common denominator and all of that it was me like i was the problem unless i changed unless i was willing to accept who i was and and how to figure out a way to fix it nothing was going to change and you know for a lot of reasons i got many opportunities you know but i just i could never make it work and when I finally had kind of started to figure it out a little bit, when I had been mentored by the likes of Jim Harbaugh and Brad Johnson and Trent Dilfer, um, Wade Wilson, who was my coach in Dallas, when I had finally figured that out, my body let me down. You know, my wrist, I, I injured it pretty significantly uh, in my third year in the league, and I, I couldn't, I wasn't as talented anymore. Because no matter what, no matter how bad of a person I behaved as, like my talent was still, you know, present everybody could see that and that's the reason why I kept getting opportunities but by at the end uh you know I wasn't as talented as everybody else my wrist wouldn't let me do it it would pop out um didn't know where the ball was going to be going to go my accuracy of course was incredibly limited and I was just so sick and tired of being beat up both physically and mentally uh, that I just I walked into Mike Holmgren's office which is my last stop in Seattle and I just I told him I quit it it sounds like you were trying to do everything on your own and I've heard you talk about before in the sports industry, sometimes it's kind of frowned upon to ask for help or to, to see a therapist or to talk to a mental skills professional. It's something that it was 
previously viewed as weak. And I, I hope that all the mental health awareness stuff in our culture today, as our society as Americans is changing that. But do you think it would have really helped to have had a mentor, to have had someone take you under your wing if you would have even let them? And, and how important do you see that as going back? Because I know I have a lot of listeners on this podcast that are youth athletes, high school athletes, college athletes. If they are super talented and they are perceived as having a bad attitude, what can they do to learn from your example, something that you've been through, what would have really helped you and what might have turned the corner for you? I think if I would have started doing things that, that weren't about me, that wasn't about me, um, you know, made it about somebody else being of service in some way, shape or form that was outside of the, the football world, um, where you, where you realize that, you know, I may do something really well and I'm admired for it, but it doesn't make me any different or better than anybody else. I think that was, I, I just thought I was better than most people. And by being better, it means you can't show weakness uh, and you can't, um, you know, you, you've never seen somebody in your lifetime growing up in Montana and that cowboy culture. And then in the locker rooms, I'd never seen another man actually ask for help. So, you know, how would I know to do it? Um, I saw that as weakness and, uh, and so therefore I didn't, you know, I didn't go into Mike Holmgren's office and tell him all the things I was going through. I was really starting to develop some mental health issues at the time, some, some clinical depression, some anxiety, I had a real narcissistic personality disorder. And I was dealing with PTSD, which, which I had no idea was, I was capable of that. You know, when you go from being the most beloved person in a, a city in San Diego, and then two weeks later, you're the most hated and, and throughout the, the league, that's a traumatic experience. And I always minimize that because I used to think PTSD was, you know, you were in combat or you were sexually assaulted or, 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 or physically assaulted or something like that at some point where there's trauma, significant trauma. I didn't understand that. And of course I wasn't diagnosed and, and, and I wasn't going to go to some professional because people that did that are crazy and I'm not crazy. I'm strong. I'm and so I never did any of that. And I just figured I could walk away from the game. I really did. I really thought I could just walk away with all the things that made me success, the money, the power, the prestige would have a little bit of a tarnish to it now that I was, um, you know, retired and wasn't the starting quarterback anymore. But I still thought that I would, I would just disappear and be fine. But we're talking about me 25 years later. Um, and I know a lot of it has to do with what goes on the second act of my, of my life. Um, but my name doesn't go away. It's not. Every April, it's going to be brought up because I'm considered yeah. one of the biggest busts of all time when it comes to the NFL draft and draft alongside arguably the greatest to play in Peyton Manning, of course. So my name doesn't go away. So there had to be, and, and, and I, I hated it so much. I hated it that that's the way people uh, viewed me, that my hometown and home state now could like go, I yeah, the way I went to them and said, I told you so, they they turned around and was like, I told you so. I told you so. You are You are worthless just like we've always known. And uh, um, and that doesn't go away and unless you address it. Unless you address it in some way, shape, or form in a healthy, positive way, it doesn't go away. It becomes an anchor that you drag around, so much so that it will uh, ultimately take you to you know, whatever bottom you think is uh, not, not, not available to you. It is there, and it is available, and, and you'll find it. So, so you're talking about the second act of your life. You retire from football. You are living in Vegas at the time. You're you're going to boxing matches, or or maybe you're visiting Vegas, and you're going to boxing matches. and And you say that you were at a boxing match at the MCM MGM Grand. They announce all the celebrities in attendance. Everyone gets a, a rousing round of applause. They announce your name as a celebrity, and everyone boos you. And a friend offers you a pain pill, and you had been drinking. And the combination of a pain pill and alcohol numbs your physical pain and your psychological and emotional pain for the first time. Yeah. I mean, I, I had been introduced to a, a, a Vicodin before I've had, you know, 15 surgeries now orthopedically from playing sports. And after every surgery, I was given this, this medication, uh, this opiate painkiller and it did its job. I mean, I was in physical pain, acute pain and it did its job. And then when I was able to start rehabbing and start competing again, um, you know, I didn't think about it again. Competition was my first drug of choice and, uh, I no longer had competition. And now I felt less than and judged when I was at these events, though I still was narcissistic enough to want to be there because I still wanted people to think that I was important, that I was okay. 
And so I would go to these parties after the event in Vegas a lot of times, and they're Hall of Famers and Super Bowl champions, and and I felt less than and judged when I was in those those rooms, of course. And uh, and I thought everybody was looking at me and talking about me, and of course they weren't. That's just the narcissist in you. And uh, an acquaintance of mine offered me some Vicodin, and this would be the first time that I actually abused it. I think a lot of people associate my story to having had a drug problem while I was playing. I'd love to blame the fact that I was a shitty football player because – I was high all the time, but it wasn't the case. You know, I didn't, I would binge drink sometimes when I was in the NFL. Um, but you know, I've, I've, the only drug I've ever taken in my life is, is an opiate painkiller. You know, um, I haven't seen any other, even though the other drugs, I've never seen cocaine. I've never witnessed, uh, anybody shooting up heroin or anything like that. Even in my, my darkest of days, it was an opiate painkiller that he gave me that I mixed with the alcohol that night. And I didn't feel any of that judgment. I didn't feel any of that fear or, or or anything or less than it it worked it worked exactly how it affected my my physical pain um i had found my answer i thought like if i think i'd just been searching for not feeling anything you know and uh this worked and for like the next eight years of my life it was gonna it was a constant battle to get to that place again to not feel anything um at first it was easy doctors of course you would go see uh, you would show them the X-rays. You were beat up as a beat up for a living. I'd manipulate the situation if they had kids, offer autographs, things like that. And before you know it, they were just shelling out these pills because, of course, doctors didn't understand. Uh, this was, you know, the the early 2000s, and the opioid epidemic had, had not um, reared its ugly head, and so oh, it was easy to get them. Um, I didn't have a drug dealer. Um, so no one knew I was doing it except my doctor. So I was thinking I was doing it the wrong thing, the wrong thing, the right way, kind of. You know, I was in pain. I just didn't tell them it was this emotional pain because if I would have told them that, they would have, they would probably would have recommended a psychiatrist and, uh, I and think, a counseling I think th- and things of that I, nature. I think that's a really good distinction to make also is that you were getting this medicine from doctors and you thought that at the time you were doing the wrong thing in the right way. Because you didn't have a drug dealer, and and there's there's something to that there that I feel like a lot of people are going through. I I know two people who are going through either addiction themselves or have a spouse that are that are abusing painkillers right now. What what can you talk say to the family members? What can you say to those people as someone that's been through it and came out the other side so successfully? It's the uh, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, and. We just went through a you know half an hour now of, of me talking about doing things that were unimaginable for someone where I'm from. And this was the hardest thing I ever did because I couldn't stop on my own. As much as I tried, as much as I thought I'll, I'm going to quit tomorrow, the psychological effect that opiates have on your brain chemistry is uh, there has to be a complete surrender and acceptance to help and much of the time when I was approached and, and I kept it to myself, people knew something was wrong, but they didn't, they didn't know what was what really going on um, until I started getting into trouble. Um, so you, you don't know what to do. You don't, I didn't want anybody to know I was, first of all, I, people thought I was this failure at, at, at this thing I wanted to be. Uh, and now I was going to add to that, a you know, junkie, you know, uh, that, that was something that no one, no one could see or no one could hear. I thought that would just make things even worse. Um, as long as I remained rich and famous, uh, I had an advantage over everybody in my mind. And so I, I just, I wasn't willing to talk about it. And that's the biggest thing. People watch people go through all this. And then unless you're willing to accept the help and surrender to, to the fact that you have no control over, um, or, or, or the ability to manage life on life's terms, Uh, there's nothing really you can do or anybody can do. Like if I would have gotten sober on my parents' timeline or or the people that cared about me on my, their timeline, it would have been 10 years before that I actually did, you know, it it ultimately is, is on you. And for me, uh, I couldn't do it on my own. So I had to be intervened with. And ultimately, um, back home where I'm supposed to be the hero, but instead broke living in a little apartment waking up every morning wondering if I had pills and if I didn't, how do I get them? Well, luckily, uh, the sheriff's department showed up and saved my life. 
The sheriff's department saved your life in the form of putting you in prison for 32 months and in solitary confinement for 83 days, which is, to me seems completely unimaginable. What what was prison like? Well, prison prison is is not a deterrent. Prison is just another society in our in our culture. It's a reason why we're the most heavily populated prison system in the world. Um, jail, like county jail, when you're first arrested, that's that's the worst place imaginable because you don't get any of the luxuries. You don't have a little TV that you have in your room. I mean, you don't you don't have like I said, prison's like another society. County jail is where the where the psychosis took over for me because to you to your point, you said I, I spent the first eighty three days in solitary confinement because the sh- local sheriff uh, was worried that someone was going to try to make a name for themselves and hurt me. So it was for my own good, is what they said. I never came across that ever in my you know three years of of interaction with law enforcement and 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 fellow inmates that anybody ever wanted to hurt me. They more wanted to hear stories and, you know, be around a former NFL quarterback is what they wanted. And so 83 days uh, coming out of using for eight years, it's the worst possible place you can imagine inside my brain for those 83 days. The fear and the the judgment uh, of myself and of everybody else is – is just the recipe for my psychosis. And it was, I mean, I was, when they sent me away to initially the first part of my prison stint was in uh, a treatment facility and I was so wrecked. I was such, you know, no one was going to help me and I was going to be as difficult as possible. Like I thought there was no future for me either. So ultimately I get kicked out of there and sent to the real prison. And then I spend the, the rest of my time there doing nothing, sitting on my butt, I blew up to like 325 pounds. I was about to stroke out from high blood pressure. Wow. I mean, uh, I, I suppose I wanted to die. And um, and I was moving my, myself towards that direction. You know, I treated people horribly. I only, uh, I only let my parents like visit twice. Uh, I went outside twice. Um, I just wrecked havoc with the guards. Um, I just thought I was so much smarter than them, of course. And you know, I guess it was my way of controlling the situation. And, and, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if, if anybody, you know, got to meet me during that, you know, 26 month span, um, what you had heard about me in the past would have, you know, would have looked, um, glorifying to what I was at now. And, uh, it just goes to show you like prison isn't rehabilitative. Like it just like anything in life, unless you're willing to to be make a conscious choice and conscious change, yeah. like you, prison's just a place where you're gonna get worse. And and get worse you did until your roommate kind of pulled your head out of your bum, right? He what finally got through to you was when your roommate says, You have more value than you realize. You have value to yourself and you have value to the world. You can provide service and you can help people by sharing your story. And in the first place, by teaching the people that don't know how to read within the prison, how to read. Tell me how that turned you around. Well, you know, I talked about how the sheriff's department saved my life. Uh, This is a higher power thing. Like this is something greater than me out there that knew maybe I had a bigger purpose. It's the only thing I can think of. Uh, sent the sheriff's department my way and then and then all of a sudden put this this individual in my path while in prison my roommate who was an afghan iraqi war veteran who had been there for eight years who made amends for what he had done and tried to be better every day and i just thought he was stupid i mean i just i was i was resigned to the fact that we are losers we are prisoners we are you know in prison all the there was no future for us, um, for me or anybody in there. And so, like you said, then one day he must have felt comfortable enough to confront me, and he confronted me and said I had some value. And I don't know if he necessarily saw what what the value has become, but I think he he just wanted to be – he wanted to help first, and I also think he wanted me to help him with his 
I was the only one with a, a collegiate degree in there. I think he wanted some help with his math. I think ultimately too is what he wanted for his uh, uh, for his ACTs and stuff. Because he wanted to get out and he wanted to go be a, a helicopter pilot and go to engineering school and all these things. And he had all these goals. And I'm like, I'm not going to help you with your math because guess what? You're not getting out of here, right? You're not getting out of here. You're not going to go do anything special with your life just like me, you know? And uh, maybe because the substance had been out of my system for 26 of those 32 months. But I went down to that library. I did it begrudgingly still. I... You know, remember walking down that hallway, metaphorically kicking rocks, thinking this is silly, this is stupid, this isn't going to help me, doesn't even know how important I am. And so uh, the idea that you're still important when you're in a red jumpsuit in prison is hilarious in my eyes now. And I walked into these rooms, and the guy came up to me who, in a place where you're supposed to show no vulnerability, ask for help. Say, I can't read, I need help, can you help me? My first reaction was, what's wrong with this dude? Uh, and then I started doing it. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know what was happening. Like, you know, I, I came back the next day and the next day and then a week had passed and then and a month. And I was sleeping better and I was more personable and I was uh, talking to my family. And uh, what I came to understand is that I was being of service to another human being for the first time in my life. I used to think what I did on Saturdays and Sundays was me being of service, and that's that's hysterical. Um, but you have to be, you have to do it. You have to show up. It's not like you go to the gym one day, and you wake up the next day, and you look like the Rock, right? I mean, you have to, you have to be consistent. And you got to show up, and that's what the last six months of my prison stay was like. It was about making it about other people, and I knew when and when I got out that it was going to have to be at the foundation of who I was, or nothing was going to change. Most likely, I'd be back there, or more likely, I'd be dead. So, so then we enter act, act three of your life, right? Your, your comeback story. There was 88 prisoners on your cell block. 86 of them are either still there, never got out or end up back there. But you and your roommate who made service to others, a priority got out and are staying out. Talk to me about your transition, the importance of being of service to others and what you're doing now. Yeah, so those first few months when I got out, I mean, when I walked out of that prison cell, it was December 3rd, 2014. I'm like, there was nothing. You know, there was no... The one thing I did have is I had a place where I could lay my head. And a lot of prisoners who, when they get out, they don't have that. My mom and dad, who have unconditionally loved me my whole life, um, had a place where I could lay my head, and at least to get started. But there was nothing. No one wanted to be around me. There's no job opportunities. Um, I had no money. My credit score was horrible. And simply, like, people didn't want to be around me. My hometown newspaper ran a, a comic uh, the day I got out that went, you know, it's a little cartoon that said, you know, lock up your medicine cabinets, Ryan Leaf's out. In my hometown. Yeah. After I'd just gone through. I mean, they, they loved rubbing it in. You know, they, they have no problem. Um, rub it in and so that's what I went back to really toxic environment um, and so for the first three months my parole officer wouldn't let me go to treatment so I had to sit there and figure it out and so I started doing little things that had helped me while I was in there I started doing some service things where I would go down to the the mission uh, to the soup kitchen uh, to the goodwill uh, donated some things my time and that seemed to stave off some of the muscle memory of how I deal with anything. I don't know how much longer that would have affected me in that toxic environment of, of Great Falls, Montana. But luckily for me, my, my parole officer must have saw some sort of evidence. And he, uh, he okayed my, my travel to, uh, to a treatment facility in Southern California. And I stayed 90 days there. After getting out, I got a job working as a driver and as a manager of a sober living house where my whole job, what I was getting paid for 15 bucks an hour, by the way, um, was about being of service in some way to another human being. And, uh, and I remember getting that first paycheck and I've, you know, gotten paychecks for millions and millions of dollars. 
and this one was for hundreds. And I felt more value than I'd ever felt in my life. So um, my perception of what success was, was, was shifted quite significantly. And that's where it all kind of started. And I still thought I could just get out and do whatever I wanted um, and be kind of hidden to the public. But I was, I was ushered into it immediately that that's, it's just not going to happen. You know, April came around while I was in treatment. It was, I was bombarded by the, the news media once again. And um, I had to start to figure out a way to t- kind of take that power back. And my boss at the time suggested I start, you know, kind of sharing my story. My sponsor in, in my, my fellowship group, he started talking about how I can't keep this peaceful, unchaotic life unless I give it away. I didn't quite understand what that meant at the time, but it means give away your story. It's about give yourself away to, to, to maintain and accept everything that comes with it. And that's where it started. Started talking locally to some high schools, some community events. And then before I know it, ESPN came a call in with a uh, E60 piece. And usually when they come in, they do this thing for like a week. They come spend a week with you. And I was just like, that's that's not going to work for me. I can I can bullshit you for a week. And you can do some <laughs> crazy puff piece. And I said, uh, I want 18 months of your of your time. And if you're willing to do it, I'm willing to to give you everything. And I for sure thought they would shut it down and say, no, we, we don't have the time to spend on that, you know. But Tom Rinaldi, uh, he was all in. And for the next 18 months, they would send camera crews out for some things. They'd be around for some things, but for 18 months. So there was proof in the pudding. There wasn't just this thing that I'd always been good at, and I was telling you a good tale, telling you a good story. There was actually action behind it. And when that when that ultimately came out publicly, it it changed the perspective of a lot of people. Now, the people I'd been living with for the last two years, um, my to be wife and um, and family, they 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 got to witness a different person, right? A different version of me. Um, and so, when the the success from it started to come, where I was then starting to get some offers to do some broadcasting things do some more things in the public eye. Nick Saban was the first coach to ask me to come speak to his football program, which has been the best referral that there is. Um, I'm asked to come to, you know, five to 10 schools every fall to talk to their football programs. Um, When that stuff started to come and the ego, of course, that comes with that to be on stage and be applauded and talk about how great you are and stuff like that. Then there was a, a reinvestment in, in doing the right thing. Um, and that was ultimately about being of service to others. So that's what the last act has been. It is far from finished. I am still an incredibly flawed human being, trying to be ever trying to be better every single day. Mess up all the time. I have a little five year old now, trying to be a good partner. I screw that up a ton uh, with my wife. Um, the way I communicate, who I was my whole life, you just don't change, right? It, it's gradual. It's evolution. And so I. You know, I try. I try my best. Um, I do know that I lay my head down at night uh, it, with a lot of peace uh, and an unchaotic life, which was, you know, I think I vibrated for the for the most part of my life. And uh, and doesn't mean I'm happy. I don't like that word. Life is still life. It's still hard. Ultimately, like we've talked about, life is not fair. It's about how you deal with it that matters. And uh, I feel like I've been dealing it with an, uh, with a, in a more positive and healthy way, you know, over the last, you know, eight years since I've been out of prison. And uh, and it, it, it really has given me the life of my dreams. Like, it, it, it really has. The, the, the things I get to do, the experiences, it's all rooted in the foundation of making it about other people. So that that's at the foundation. I'm a partner with the Menninger Clinic down in Houston, Texas. They're one of the most specialized uh, psychiatric uh, substance abuse facilities in the country um, to be able to have an asset like that at my fingertips to help people uh, has been huge. And then I travel the country mostly speaking a ton and all of that laid the foundation for what I get to do on the, on the sports side of things and the broadcasting aspect of things and which is a hell of a lot of fun, but none of it, none of it would be possible if it, if I, if I stopped doing the things that, that, I started doing the moment I walked out of that prison cell. Yeah. You said that originally you thought that success meant that you had money, power, and prestige, and that you've learned that that was wrong over the years. 
What is success to you now? Accountability, spirituality, and community. That's what success is. I was never accountable to anybody or anything my whole life. I blamed doctors, law enforcement, my family, the NFL, the media, everybody. And you have no control over anything those people do. What you have control over is what you do. So accountability for me is knowing that you're exactly where you're at because of what you did and nobody else. And when you make it that simple, you really can't blame anything on anybody ever again. You can't control what anybody else says, does, or thinks at all. You can only control with what you do. And, you know, when, when you're triggered and somebody insults you or, um, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily deal with it well in the moment sometimes. Sometimes you do. But I think in the past, I was just I just dealt with it in a negative and toxic way. And that's accountability to me. Uh, second thing, spirituality. I just, I you know, there's a godlike feeling to be a, a professional athlete and uh, and the importance of who you are. And there's a there's a reason why I'm here still. When there's a, a bunch of my former brothers and teammates who are no longer here because, you know, they they didn't they didn't choose um a different path. They chose the, what they thought was the easier, softer way out. Um, and I think some of their stories would have been so much more impactful than mine because they were much better at the sport than I was. And so there's a ton of survivor's guilt for me, like why me? But there's a spirituality wrapped around that. I think the best way to put it is I know there's a God and it's not me. That's the simplest version of the way I, I could say it. And in the community, Never part of a community. Growing up, I was head and shoulders above everybody else. I think the closest I found a community was in college when we were all kind of similar. But ultimately, that pedestal rose too. And I was being told I was the greatest football player in America. To you know, the end when I was deep into my drug habit, um, I didn't have a community there. I didn't even have the community of having a drug dealer and uh, mm -hmm. users to use with. I I loved my my pills by myself with no one seen. I wasn't going to waste my high on anybody else. So my community was not there. And once I got to Southern California and saw what the community was like, uh, saw that there was no stigma, there was no judgment. I put myself right in the middle of it. And now that community gets to travel, right? It travels all over the country. Uh, it allowed me to meet you at Super Bowl, um, things like that. Uh, there will be relationships that I make now in my life where my community gets bigger, that they'll be in my life the rest of my life in a positive and healthy way. So those three things, if you adapt those some way, shape, or form into your to your livelihood, you know, accountability, spirituality, and community, like success. And I'm 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 the example of that for sure. Well, you're certainly you're certainly proof that you can recover from everything. And where there's a will, there's a way. And I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you walking me through your story from unimaginable success to learn from the mistakes I made so you don't make them as well to total redemption, total comeback story. I know everyone that listens to this will understand you, will love you, and will be rooting for you. One more question before I let you go. If there is a high school athlete that is either has big dreams, and, and you can do go dealer's choice on this one, either advice for them to accomplish the great dreams that you were able to accomplish or a cautionary tale of if they're going through a hard time, how can they get through it? What would you say? Um, it's never as big as you think it is. Even the, you know, even the worst times for me, you know, the, the worst of it would be no longer to be here. So it, it's never, it's never the end. You're going to be okay. Um, just know that, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to be vulnerable. It doesn't cost you anything to to ask for help. In fact, those are two things that are maybe the strongest things you'll ever be able to do. So that's always my best advice to to young athletes is understand that, you know, just because you're great at something doesn't make you a good person. If you build from the ground up when in terms of being a good person, then usually the, the sports side comes with it. There's a fine line between an elite, uh, elite athlete and asshole, and that's just – something you have to, have to deal with in a, as a balancing act. Um, and then understand that um, the best way for you to get out of yourself is to make it about other people. 
So if you were the greatest thing in the world in high school and, you know, a five-star recruit and everybody's offering you all this NIL money and everything like that, and you think you're better than everybody else, you know, figure out a way to make it about somebody else, make it about somebody outside yourself. And that usually will, will humble you in a way where it'll bring you back to a place where you can go, okay, I'm really blessed and grateful that I get to do this and be great at it. Um, but I also understand it's not, even though the, the world around us sees football or sports, professional sports in particular as an institution in this country, doesn't make me more important or less important than anybody else out there. We're just all flawed human beings trying to be better every day. Awesome. Well, if you're listening, I hope you are taking notes because this man has been through it all and he has seen it all and he's come out on the other side stronger. Ryan, thank you so much. This is Finding the Way. Thanks for listening to Finding the Way with Ryan LaVarnway. Find previous episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.